Today we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Hear the word of the Lord. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Amen. God's holy word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you for the sufferings of Christ, his grace to us, that Christ has ceased the punishment of sin for those who receive him by grace. We as well, Lord, acknowledge that we need to arm ourselves with the ability by the power of the Spirit to put the death sin. So, Lord, we just commit to you this time. We pray that we'd be changed and transformed, joyful in your work, and as well, Lord, ready and willing to put the death sin. In Jesus' good name, amen. One of the most action-packed summers I had experienced while I was working at my parents' restaurant was a hot summer morning. Someone took a big rock and smashed one of the big windows in my parents' restaurant. Of course, the restaurant had a security alarm and the alarm went off startling and frightening the thieves who were trying to steal from my parents' restaurant. They fled the scene of the crime and went on to the next place where they could try and steal some quick cash and get out of there and do their thing, make a quick getaway. They headed to everyone's favorite bakery in my hometown called Lakeside Bakery. They broke into the bakery, but they didn't realize that that Place two as well had an alarm system. They had no idea what to do. So they did what every criminal mind would do. They tried to convince the police officers who were coming to arrest them that they didn't break into this bakery, but were actually bakers. So they turned on the lights and they started to act like baking and look like they were actually working in this bakery. I wish I could have been there to see this great acting performance. When the cops arrived, these, these criminals were acting like they worked there, but they were so bad at their acting, it didn't take the cops long to realize and to catch on what they were up to. They were arrested and taken into custody. These criminals were acting like bakers, but they were anything but bakers. The word actor is actually the Greek word hypocrite. These criminals were claiming to be bakers, but they were not bakers. Now, many people in the Canadian church are doing the same thing with their profession of faith in Christ. The majority of Canadians, according to the last, last statistics coming out of our census, the majority of Canadians do claim to be Christian, but when we look at the Canadian culture, it's anything but biblical Christianity. Therefore, we can say that although many profess to be Christians, either they do not understand what a Christian is and what a Christian is all about, or they are in fact not Christians. We also need to be clear that no pastor or fellow person will be judging you or anyone else on Judgment Day. So we need to realize that yes, only God is the judge, and we, all of us, each one of us, will have to give an account to the Father for the good we have done, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So Christian, let us be confident in the grace that God has given us in the person and work of Christ. And Christian, let us also be diligent to make sure that we're actually following the Lord. Let us be diligent that if 
we embrace Christ and we're going to be a follower of Christ that we actually follow Christ. Let us not be inconsistent with our profession of Jesus Christ by our actions as Christians. But maybe why there's so much false and fake Christianity in Canada is because many people have embraced a false view of Jesus. I'm always amazed how people make Jesus out to be a person who actually doesn't care about sin at all. And they quote their select scriptures, which are ripped seriously out of context. Now, I've just finished the Gospel of Matthew. And I'm always reminded when I read the Gospels how serious Jesus considered sin and how holy Jesus is described in the Gospels, even in the Gospel of Matthew. Let us not buy into the false teaching that Jesus didn't care about sin. He only cared about people. Because you're not going to find that Jesus in the Bible. We are now in a new section in the book of 1 Peter. And that section is chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. In this section, Peter is really dealing with the issue of how one lives out their Christian life in what we call the last days. In chapter 4, 1 to 6, Peter writes about holy living, specifically in the area of holy living in a culture where the culture is extremely unholy. And in chapter 4, verses 7 to 11, Peter writes how to live out the last days as you function as a church in the body of Christ. Today we're looking at verses 1 to 3, and we have three points. 4 verse 1, the suffering of Christ. 4 verse 2, stop sinning. In 4 verse 3, we get a list of sins of sinners. So let's start with 4 verse 1, suffering of Christ. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh. Peter starts chapter 4 with another important word, therefore. So we must ask the question, what is the therefore, therefore? With the use of the therefore, Peter is reminding us of the foundation of the Christian faith, the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. And when he says therefore, he's pointing us back to really the start of 1 Peter 3.18, but he's also reminding us of the suffering of Christ in 1 Peter 2.24. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for all for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. And as well, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Peter cannot stop writing about the death of Jesus Christ, the work of Christ on the cross for sinners. When Peter mentions the sufferings of Christ, we're reminded that Jesus suffered on the cross, and we're also reminded of the many benefits that come to people who receive Jesus Christ by faith. So Peter is reminding us of these wonderful truths of the effects of of the suffering or death of Christ. Number one, in 1 Peter 3.18, Jesus died once for all. This means that Jesus paid the penalty for sin for all time. There no longer needs to be another sacrifice for all the sins that we commit. Christ dealt with sin once for all. Number two, in 3.18, Jesus suffered for sin. This means that Jesus bore the punishment of sin. Jesus bore the wrath of God so that those who come to him can have the wrath of God removed from them. 3. 1 Peter 3.18 Because Jesus suffered on the cross and by his gracious work, Jesus reconciles us to God. Our sins have separated us from God, but through Christ and his work we can be brought to God. 1 Peter 2.24 Jesus bore our sins on the tree. This reminds us again of Jesus bearing God's judgment. He bore our sins because he went to the cross. He was hung upon the tree. He bore the curse of God as Deuteronomy 21 talks about. 
In 1 Peter 2, 24, because of the work of Christ upon the cross, the Christian is made alive in Jesus Christ and thus dead to sin. And in 1 Peter 2, verse 24, by the wounds of Christ, we're healed from the consequences of sin. And we're now restored to God. In 1 Peter 4, verse 1, Peter writes about these sufferings in the flesh. Christ suffered in the flesh. And Peter again reminds us of the work of Christ as he died on the cross. Peter reminds us of the wrath of God that Jesus bore in our place so that we could experience mercy, forgiveness, and righteousness. And the death of Jesus Christ is obviously central to Peter's letter and, of course, central to Peter's life and ministry. Now, here's the question. Is the death of Christ central to your life? Is your prayer, thank you, Father, for Jesus and the cross. Are you overflowing with thankfulness because of what Christ has done for you? Since Jesus suffered in the flesh, the Christian ought to have a certain attitude towards sin. And we see this in this next phrase. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Peter gives this church a command to arm themselves. This is a military word for fighting. The word arm is defined as getting ready or equipped for military warfare. Peter is clearly teaching us that the Christian life is a spiritual battle. There's a battle between the spirit within us, our sinful nature, the world around us, and Satan and demonic forces. Paul taught about the spiritual battle of the Christian life in the book of Ephesians. And notice, it's focused upon the work of Christ. Ephesians 6, 10 to 17, finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers. Over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil of day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore having fastened the belt of truth put and put on the breastplate of righteousness. And his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of, sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Since Jesus Christ has suffered in the flesh, and given the Christian new life, amazing grace, Christians are to arm themselves for battle in the Christian life, for the obedience to the Lord. Jesus has paid the punishment for the sins of the Christian. Jesus has reconciled the Christian back to, back to God. Jesus has given the Christian life. And Jesus has been victorious over sin. Therefore, the Christian is to arm themselves with the gospel so that they can put to death sin. How much time do you spend arming yourself with the gospel of Christ? Do you preach to yourself the wonderful grace of God, knowing the grace of God fuels your obedience to God. When was the last time that you reminded yourself, hey, I, I no longer have to give in to sin. Christ has saved me. He's given me life. I'm dead to sin. Jesus has died and God has raised him from the dead. Therefore, we ought to live a holy life and give him all the glory. And this verse ends, for whatever for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. There are several different interpretations on this verse. Some think that those who suffer under persecution, they actually sin. They cease from sinning. But what Paul is teaching us here is Christ has suffered and he has ceased sin. Because of the sufferings of Jesus on the cross, Jesus dealt with our sin once for all so that we could have peace and joy and faith in him. By means of the death of Jesus, the power of sin was broken. And we see, see the same truth taught in the book of Romans. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. 
Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but he, the life he lives, he lives to God. Praise the Lord. Jesus has dealt with our sin on the cross, but we as Christians are called to be diligent to put the death sin every day for the glory of the Lord. And now we can get to our next point, chapter 4, verse 2, stop sinning. He writes, Peter, so as to live for the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Peter, with this next verse, gives us two options for our lives. We can live our lives for point number one, human passions. And therefore, if we're calling ourselves a Christian and we're living for human passions, we are therefore a hypocrite. Or we can live our lives for the will of God. Let's look at human passions. Human passions, as you see here, are in direct opposition in contrast to the will of God. These passions are desires or ways or things that we do in our life that violate the will of God. Now, for instance, when the Bible says covet and you covet, you're carrying out human passions. Or it says put to death lust, put to death sexual immorality, and you live out lust and sexual immorality. Those are human passions. These are passions and desires that are against God's law, God's ways, God's desires for us. And then we have the will of God. Now, when many people talk about the will of God, they often refer to it as something that needs to be sought out or discovered. You might hear people say, I'm still wondering what the will of God is for my life. But the will of God is not something that's hidden or that you have to seek out or you have to wonder about. The will of God is clearly talked about in the word of God. Do you remember when Jesus was teaching and the people who were listening to Jesus said, Hey, your brothers and mothers are here. And Do you remember how Jesus responded to that? Jesus was very clear that those who do the will of God are his family. Matthew 12, verse 50, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, sister, and mother. The will of God refers to God's demands to us in the word of God. If the Lord commands that we should avoid something, then the will of God is that we avoid that sin. If the Lord commands that we obey him in an area of our life, then the will of God is obedience to God in that area of our life. Paul reminds the Christians in Thessalonica to live for the will of God. And the will of God is that they would be holy. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Christian, you're given such a short time on earth. Use that time for the glory of the Lord, for the will of God, and not for human passions. Live the rest of your life for Jesus Christ. If you've been saved by Christ and saved by grace and are a follower of Jesus, no longer lived your life for human passions, but live for the will of God. And now we get to this final point, sins of sinners. Verse 3 of chapter 4 of 1 Peter. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Peter says something we need to consider in our hearts. We have spent enough time sinning. When we look at our lives, we're probably going to realize that we sin more than we ever should have or we ever wanted to. And those sins sometimes come back to bite us either with guilt or with consequences. We've done enough in the sin department. And Paul exhorts Christians numerous times in the Bible to don't go back to your old ways of the Gentiles. He says this in Ephesians 4.17. Now I say in testifying the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. 1 Peter 4 verse 3 calls us to avoid six particular sins. 
Now, that these six sins are mentioned, they're actually broken down into three types of sins. First, sins of sexual immorality, where he uses sensuality and passions. These are actions and thoughts that violate God's boundaries for marriage. There's two, there's sins of drunkenness. He uses drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, excess of drinking of alcohol, and all that goes along with it. And number three, sins of idolatry. He says lawless idolatry. This is idol worship or worshiping anything that is not true and the living God. So let's talk about this first sin, sensuality. This refers to a lack of constraint that leads to actions that violate the law of God in the area of human sexuality. This is living a life outside of God's design for marriage, which is between one man and one woman. Two, passions. These are sinful desires that violate the commands of God for marriage. This word can also be translated lust. It's the desire to live out a sinful lifestyle in the area of human sexuality. Three, drunkenness. This is intoxication from alcohol. Four, orgies. This is an excessive feasting in the area of food and drink and sexual immorality. Five, drinking parties. This is a gathering where people are just getting drunk with alcoholic beverages and all other sinful behaviors that go along with it. And finally, lawless idolatry. This would be the worship of false gods. Note that all of these six sins that are mentioned here are things that they would have done in the culture, in the pagan culture that they grew up in. They would have partied hard, committed sexual immorality, and devoted themselves to the worship of false gods. But they were to put these sins to death. Well, how does this passage apply to our hearts and to our lives? First, we want to be reminded that Christ died for you. Christ died for us. Peter reminds us again of the wonderful work of Jesus upon the cross. Christ Jesus suffered for us and that suffering of Jesus, because of it, the consequences of our sin have ceased. The work of Jesus has dealt with once for all the judgment that we deserve to bear for our sin, the punishment of sin, and of course the shame of sin. Let us hear the wonderful work of Christ on our behalf one more time from 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2.24 he himself bore our sins in the body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By, your, by his wounds you've been healed. 1 Peter 3.18 Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In 1 Peter 4 verse 1 Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. If you're outside of Jesus Christ today, know Christ has died for you so that you could have your sin record erased, so that you could be reconciled back to God, you can have peace with God. No longer stay in your sin, leave your sin. You've spent enough time sinning and rebelling against God. Trust in Christ and you'll have eternal life because of Christ's work done for you. Him alone, Christian. Let us be truly thankful for what the Lord Jesus has done for us. Christian, let our hearts be joyful for the work of Christ. Christian, let us praise the Lord for Christ's work done on our behalf. Next, Christian, arm yourself to fight sin. As followers of the Lord Jesus, we need to arm ourselves mentally in the Word of God to deal with sin, to put sin to death. Peter has already exhorted us numerous times to put to death sin. In 1 Peter 1.13, Peter said, Therefore, prepare your minds for action, being sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. In light of the grace of God given to us, this new birth and living hope, we are to prepare our minds for actions, arm ourselves, set our hope fully on Christ. We're called to be obedient children. We're called not to be conformed to our past 
lifestyle that was sinful. In 1 Peter 1, 15-16, Peter exhorted these Christians to be holy because God is holy. You shall be holy, for I am holy. In 1 Peter 2, verse 1, Peter exhorts these Christians to put away sin. So put away all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. And in 1 Peter 2, 11, Peter exhorts the Christian to abstain from the passions of the flesh. 2, 11, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. In 1 Peter 4, 1 to 3, Peter exhorts these Christians to put to death, rid themselves of the sins they've indulged in the past. Christian, let us spend more time living for the will of God and avoiding putting to death the sins of human passions. Jesus Christ has dealt with those sins on the cross. We're forgiven, so let us arm ourselves and be prepared to put to death sin every single day. And finally, let us stand for biblical sexual purity. The sexual purity lines have certainly blurred in Canada over the last 50 years in this country. But the Lord has not blurred those lines. The Lord has given us clear directions. The Lord has given us clear demands. What he desires for us in the word of God. The Lord has given us the seventh commandment, which is you shall not commit adultery. Adultery is any thought or any activity that, can, that is outside the confines of God's design for marriage. And of course, the New City Catechism will help us understand sexual purity as we see in question number 11. What does God require in the seventh commandment? Answer, that we abstain from sexual immorality, live purely and faithfully, whether in marriage or in single life, avoiding all impure actions, looks, words, thoughts, or desires, or whatever might lead to them. Although our culture has an anything-goes mentality in this area of sexuality, we must be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a life that honors God with our bodies. Paul says this in Romans 6, verses 12 to 13. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make it make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Don't offer your eyes to sin looking at filth, internet, TV. Don't offer your heart to sin desiring sexual immorality. Don't offer your body to sin. Let us be reminded, of course, of God's grace given to us. He suffered for us. Christ suffered for us so that we could be reconciled to God, so that we could be dead to sin. And therefore, let us arm ourselves for sexual purity to the Lord. Thanks for watching and God bless.